case that we're covering tonight is the eye drop killer and this happened in 2018 so it is fairly new there's not much about it online um source wise so one of my main sources is the podcast that i watch um yeah and it's kind of hard to find like photos and stuff too so i'll do my best to kind of put some visual res representation up so you guys can kind of visualize everyone i one of the things that bothers me about true crime podcasts is that I don't see pictures, so when I'm watching them, I often find myself Googling the people because I like to have a visual representation of everyone involved. I'm just nosy like that. But okay, let's go ahead and get started. I did want to show you guys something, you know, because it's crazy how this little container is like highly toxic and it wasn't this one. I believe it was, um... Visine. Um, it wasn't this clear eyes, but this is the one that we use. And um, yeah, it was a Visine that this person used Lana Clayton to murder her husband. She, she literally got this and squeezed it all up in her husband's drink. So to find out the full story and to hear all the details, it is short and sweet though. Um, please, you know, watch the rest of this video. If you like the video, give me a thumbs up and all oh my OGs, I love you so much. If you're new, thank you, thank you for being here. I love you and I'll try my hardest to be more consistent, but um, yeah, life. All right. Okay, let's get started. Lana Sue Clayton is a 53-year-old South Carolina woman who murdered her husband by poisoning him to death with over-the-counter eye drops. In July of 2018, Lana Sue Clayton called the police, stating that she found her husband, Stephen Clayton, collapsed at the bottom of their Brycey Lake Wiley Mansion. When police arrived, Lana stated that she was out gardening and came inside to the sight of her husband dead at the bottom of the stairs. First responders found it odd that she did not try to resuscitate him. Stephen was pronounced dead on the scene and his body was taken in for medical investigation where it was found that Stephen did indeed suffer of a heart attack. Ooh, sorry. No further investigation was ordered on the body beyond that point. Lana told the doctors that Stephen had been feeling sick and had been bedridden for the past few days before she found him. That was like a weird pause. Lana stated that she did not suspect anything serious because Stephen did suffer from vertigo, so he would often need to be bedridden to deal with the symptoms. A few days after his death, Stephen's family and friends came around to their home to mourn with Lana. The family began to get a bit suspicious of Lana when they saw the couple's bedroom. They found a very gruesome sight. It appeared that Stephen had been stuck in the couple's bed for days and had wet himself. So just to elaborate a little bit more on that, it was stated that there was literally like urine and like stains all over the sheets. There were like, it, it, it had been like he was like locked in there. There was like food and water and it just looked like someone had been like living out of their bedroom for a few days. So the family kind of found it, you know, super like weird that... It, it, it looked like he was trapped in there or something. In response to the suspicions, Lana explained that this was a completely normal and usual occurrence. She stated that this would often occur when Stephen would suffer from his vertigo symptoms. Red flags really began to rise when the family asked Lana about Stephen's will. Stephen was a very well-off man and his family knew that he kept a will and some even witnessed the signing of it. Lana dismissed the comments and stated that Stephen did not have a will. The family also was very suspicious of the heart attack because Stephen was a very healthy man who did not have any serious issues or heart problems. They asked Lana if she would order a toxicology screening and 
further investigation on the body. This angered Lana, so she kicked the family out and began to distance herself from them. So the family started to raise suspicions and off bat, Lana literally was not about that life. She was crazy about it. Like, I know some of the nephews of Stephen were really like, I guess, suspicious of Lana because they knew that she knew that there was a will and they knew that there was a will and she kept denying that there wasn't a will. <laughs> and he was very well off. I mean, she had money too. She was, was a nurse, but he had like a lot of money, like they were rich. The family took it upon themselves to contact the city coroner's office and request a toxicology scan. Lana had ordered for the body to be cremated as soon as possible, but luckily the family was able to get to the coroner's office to stop the cremation for the toxicology scan. Yay for the family. When Lana heard about this, she began to come forward with stories about Stephen being abusive and a drug addict, and that she did not want to run a toxicology screen because she was a very because he was a very heavy drug user, and she did not want to alarm the family. So, she, so she, I guess she was trying to like cover her tracks at that point where she started, you know, saying that he was a drug user, he was an abuser. Um, there was even a story or like a police report of her actually shooting Steven a few years back with, I don't even know what it's called. It's like, um, it's like a bow and arrow, but like not a bow and arrow. I don't even know. I don't know. I don't know the right word. If I find it, I'll put the picture here, but, and she shot him like between, I know in his head somewhere, but it didn't hit his brain or anything. Um, and it was in their bedroom, and she said that she shot him on accident, and it was dismissed, like, they stayed together, and the police dismissed it, no charges were filed or anything, because they both stated it was an accident, um, there wasn't too much behind, like, what, if she thought it was an intruder or something of that nature, but when she did start coming forward with these stories, she stated that the reason that she did shoot him was to protect herself because he was being abusive towards her. And that was behavior that no one witnessed before. His family, his previous spouses, um, his previous girlfriends, no one had ever witnessed that behavior from him. The family denied all the allegations and stated that Stephen was not known to exhibit any of those behaviors. When the toxicology scan results came in, it was very evident that Stephen had a high amount of, bear with me because I'm not the best, tetrahydrosoline, tetrahydrosoline in his blood, a common chemical that could be found in over-the-counter eye drops. At that moment, investigators called Lana in for questioning, and she immediately came forth with a story about how she did put eye drops into her husband's drink in efforts to make him sick and have diarrhea. She stated that she did not intend to kill him. Investigators continued to talk to Lana and to get her full confession, but Lana's account was an impulsive decision and she did not know that the eye drops would kill him. Lana stated that she had seen a movie, and I think it's Wedding Crashers, where they put eye drops in someone's drinks. I haven't seen that movie in years, so I don't even recall that, but she said that she watched a movie and the eye drops gave the person like really bad diarrhea. Lana was then charged with the murder of her husband, Stephen, and taken into custody. During the trial, Lana and her lawyers painted Stephen out to be a very abusive husband, and they also stuck to the story that Lana did not intend to poison or kill her husband. They even stated that she got the idea, oh, this is, I, I like went a little bit too forward, <laughs> that she got the idea from the popular movie Wedding Crashers, where the eyedroppers gave the person diarrhea. <laughs> Ultimately, the persecution won. They argued that Lana knew that the chemical would kill her husband and that she had poisoned him over a period of three days before he died. So that explains why there was like a bunch of stuff, stuff in his room. So he was like literally dying in that room and she knew. Lana was a nurse, 
so she had basic knowledge of different chemicals and also the symptoms of poisoning. Lana was found guilty and sentenced to 25 years in prison. So, um, that was kind of like a, a quick little, um, story, but I did want to share it because I listened to this podcast and it was like, it's very shocking to, to know that something so basic as eye drops over the counter, um, but I, I guess it's a medication can like harm someone. Um, but ironically enough, there was a copycat killer not too far from the area. I don't have the exact research on it because I couldn't really find anything because it was really like low key. And even this case is kind of low key because it just happened in 2018. Um, but yeah, the copycat killer pretty much they they like murdered their wife. It was a man, he murdered his wife for insurance money. But I forget why the family um, suspected the eye drop kill, eye drop. I guess um, they had, someone had suspected um, that, you know, he had poisoned her, but the body had already been cremated and um, they were able to get like an old blood sample that was saved from the initial investigation because these eye drops give people heart attacks. So it's like really, it's, that's the most prominent thing. Um, and I forget the, the medical term for exactly like what happens to their body, but it gives them like a heart attack. And usually they'll, that's what the cause of death is usually stated. And she actually had, you know, the same, uh, cause of death as Stephen. So the family, her family wanted to investigate further. And that's when they saw that, you know, they did have a vial of blood and they ran the blood. And sure enough, she had that same chemical that tried to, I don't even know, <laughs> that same chemical in her blood. So yeah, I'm not sure what ended up happening on his case, but that there was a copycat killer. And just doing more research, I believe that there is an episode of one of the crime shows that also uses eye drops as like the way the person died. So yeah, so... <laughs> And it's so funny because when I listened to this podcast, I was with my husband and we were just in the car because we usually drive and listen to podcasts, um, true crime podcasts when we have like long drives. And he always uses eye drops because he has like really bad eyes um, and allergies and stuff like that. Um, so he just was like looking at me and then he looked at the eye drops that were in the center console of the car. <laughs> and I was like looking at him and I was like, don't mess with me. But you know what I mean? Like, it was just, like, crazy. Like, how something so basic. And it's tasteless. And I don't think you can smell it. So it's literally, it's clear and tasteless. So it's, like, crazy um, how toxic it could be. And I believe you have to ingest a, a lot of it um, from what research I did gather. It's not just, like, one drop. Like, it had to be, like, a squeeze in water. And she did it over a period of time. So it's not like instant, um, it's kind of like a period of time, your body will deteriorate your body and your lungs and your heart and stuff like that, so, crazy. <laughs> Alright, well, I hope you enjoyed this very short and quaint true crime video. I plan to come back with more, um, I kind of just been doing my own thing lately, like with life and mental health and trying to grasp everything so I am a little bit you know I guess behind on doing true crime and I do want to bring more unique cases forward so I do apologize if it does take some time to get some more true crime um, videos out to you I'm gonna link below some other true crime ASMR people um, that I I you know I often watch so that you don't feel like you're not getting your true crime ASMR fix okay <laughs> all right I hope you have a good day